Knievel, the most famous name in daredevil jumping. For more than a decade, Evil Knievel had no peers. Tonight, his son Robbie will try to ascend to the championship throne his father once owned, one that has gone unchallenged until now. Eddie Kidd, England's Dark Knight, has become the challenger to the Knievel name. His reputation and ability have captured the imagination of motorcycle jumping fans throughout Europe. Tonight, these two world-class jumpers will test the limits in a duel of skill and courage. Flyboy Productions and Event Entertainment in association with Casino Magic Corporation welcome you to Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. You are looking live at the premier casino on the entire Gulf Coast. We are halfway between New Orleans and Mobile, Alabama on the Gulf of Mexico, where tonight, Robbie Knievel and Eddie Kidd meet in the first ever Daredevil Duel. Welcome to the Edge, where the search for the ultimate thrill has brought a crowd from five states to this jewel along the Gulf of Mexico. Good evening, everybody. I'm Phil Stone. Tonight, the human form will confront Earth's most powerful force, gravity, where any miscalculation, a single misgiving could lead to sheer catastrophe. Believe me when I tell you this is an enormous event by all calculations. First of all, it is more than five football fields long. From this takeoff tower, 30 feet up to the runout, more than 1,520 feet away. This will also be the first time a Knievel has gone head to head, any Knievel, with anyone in a jump off competition. It has been in the making for well over a year. Lending his expertise tonight is a man who is one of the elite jumpers in the world today, Johnny Airtime. And Johnny, gone are those old, vague jumping rules of the past. Here in 1993, we're welcoming in a new governing body, and they hope to usher in brand new standards for this sport. That's right, Phil Stone. Exaggeration has run rampant in the motorcycle jumping industry. Now we've got the World Professional Motorcycle Jumping Association. And with that association is coming full-on sanctioned and measured jumps, which is going to clean up the jumping game and create a real sport. Talk about the rules for this particular competition. They have all changed, and there's no question they are for the better in this sport of motorcycle jumping. The rules, they are unique to this particular jump off. That's absolutely right, Phil Stone. First, we're going to have a target jump. The ramp gap is going to be 130 feet. Casino Magic is putting a chip on the ramp for the target at the 160-foot point. The person closest to the chip determines the winner. A $1,000 prize will be awarded in Casino Magic chips. Next comes the competition jumps. The first ramp gap is 150 feet. They're going all out for distance. Next comes the second jump. The ramp gap is stretched to 175 feet. The accumulated footage of those two jumps determines the leader. And the third jump, the challenger can challenge the leader for the next jump, and they go all out for a third and final jump. Joining us on the deck tonight is a man who once jumped 21 cars. Back in 1972, he broke Evil Knievel's record. His name is Gary Davis. And Gary, what about this competition and the motorcycles they'll ride this evening? Well, here we are in the pit, and these are the two bikes they'll be using. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Here we are in the pit, and these are the two bikes they're going to be using. They're CR500s. They're stock. They're not allowed to change anything except the pipes and the suspension. If they, the bikes are set up much stiffer to last on the on the hard coming down that they'll have. Also, we've added this little transmitter to give you this angle. Here's the look from 30 feet up on the tower. As he takes off, he'll be looking for solid shifts, making sure he doesn't miss any. Right about now, he'll start to accelerate. You'll see the vibrations start as the bike's pulling away from him. Into the air, he slams down from 22 feet in the air, and now on the brakes for a smooth landing. Now that was just one of their practice jumps. The jump's gonna get much larger and much rougher. Back to you, Phil. All right, Gary, Johnny, you've jumped more than 4,300 times in your jumping career. What about this perspective? Never seen before. Well, I tell you what, that's the, se the scene I've seen so many times, 4,300 times. And let me tell you what, these guys' hearts are pounding, and they're going to be in for the biggest jumps of their lives, and I'm super excited. All right, Johnny, let's meet the jumpers, who tonight find the lure of risk simply too tempting to ignore. Knievel, a name synonymous with two-wheel spectacles. Robbie grew up watching his father's exploits. The marquees, the crowds, the heart-pounding drama served as sirens for Robbie. At 31, he's already flown farther than his father ever flew, utilizing a style his dad rode for 13 years with huge success. 
Tonight, the Knievel name is on the line as the focus broadens. I always only had one competitor, and that was Death. And uh, now I've got two competitors. I've got Eddie Kidd, and I've got Death. Spectacular crashes are an ever-present hazard of motorcycle jumping. To fly with the Eagles, one accepts the risks associated with human and mechanical failure. The Knievels share not only the same orthopedic surgeon, but after years of family turmoil, their father-son relationship seems to be healthy once more. I just want to say I'm here to keep the name Knievel the most famous on two wheels. I'm very proud of the sport my dad created. Our relationship's good. England's Eddie Kidd also has a relationship with Evil Knievel. He brings a fire to this sport not seen since the evil era. Kidd is much more than sheer sizzle. At 17, he challenged Evil to a jump off in London where Knievel had crashed eight months prior. Evil declined. But getting a hold of a Knievel, any Knievel, has been an obsession of Eddie Kidd's, one that began in 1973. I started when I was 12 years old after seeing a movie about Evil Knievel, and I started jumping on bicycles. Back home, uh, I have a huge following. I'm sort of like the English or European version of uh, Evil Knievel back home. And when we show up to jump, I jumped like from five buses when I was uh, 15 up to eight. Then from eight buses, I jumped 13 double deckers by the time I turned 16. Two months ago, Kid went over the wall, the Great Wall of China. It's not the longest jump I've ever done, but one of the most dangerous, because if I wouldn't have landed dead in the middle of that ramp, I went down a 1,000 feet to a river, and I didn't plan on doing that. I had to smash into some boxes at the end, and, uh, well, I'm still here to, to tell the story about that one. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's get to it. Four rounds of super heavyweight motorcycle action from Casino Magic in St. in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Fourteen months in the making. They've been here for the last ten days, going at it on the practice ramps. Hand-to-hand -hand combat to be sure. Well, all of the pyrotechnics are out of the way. All there is left now, Johnny Airtime, is the jump itself. And now, we've got the cut of the cards. Both Robbie Knievel and Eddie Kidd coming over. The lowest card will have the option of jumping first. Robbie with the face card. Seven of diamonds. You're up, Eddie, babe. I'm trying to use the microphone this time. Okay, man. And there's no question this plays in to Eddie Kidd's psychology of exactly, Johnny, what he wanted to do. He wanted desperately to jump first. Well, the pressure is definitely on here. You've got not only the camera pressure, not only the crowd pressure, not only the pressure of live national television. You're competing against the jump itself, but you've got another man to consider, another man to beat, another man to push you to the very ragged limit of your capability. What about the emotion of these riders? You've jumped more than 4,300 times. What goes through your mind at a moment like this? Well, you've got to focus on your mission, and if you blow it, you blow it bad. The mistake you don't want to make is the first mistake in motorcycle jumping because it's very deadly. Now, here we've got the target jump, the first jump with a 130-foot gap, and accuracy is key. It's a good jump to warm up on for the distance jumps, but the pressure is definitely mounting for both riders. The gap from the launch ramp to the landing ramp is 130 feet, but that casino magic chip is located 30 feet down that landing ramp. So a perfect jump here, I would assume, would be dead center at 160 feet. That's right. I would expect both these jumpers to be within about 10 feet of that, uh, that marker. The dynamics of this event, Johnny, this is not a one-jump spectacle as we became so accustomed to seeing in the 60s and 70s with Evil Knievel. Tonight, we have a potential for four jumps. That's right, and you can see what distance these jumpers are jumping. We're going to tell you what the ramp gap is, and I've double-checked this myself. Also, down the landing ramp, there's hash marks every five feet. What you do is you add the ramp gap to these hash marks where the jumper landed. We're going to be officially measured 
by Spanky Spangler, who has tremendous experience in the stunt industry. Eddie Kidd on the 30-foot ramp. Being the first jump rough, Eddie Kidd's got a lot of pressure for just this accuracy jump, and if he nails it, Robbie's got all the pressure on his shoulders. Here we go. This could be a speed run. He dives out of the runway, comes down just to check the runway as he did virtually all yesterday until that vicious thunderstorm accompanied by tornadoes uh, last night. And then earlier today, he was making that speed uh, run right past the launch ramp. And now, as he does a high five with his crew chief, John Saunders, we're set to go. This will be a go for Eddie Kidd. The speed run is so that Eddie Kidd can make sure his bike is running clean all the way out. He can make sure his RPM is exactly where he wants it since he does not use a speedometer. Therefore, he's going to have the right speed this time, hopefully. Good point. Neither Knievel nor Kidd with a speedometer or a tachometer. This is done by the, as Eddie Kidd called it, the seat of the pants riding. That's right. Experience tells you uh, a lot of jumps you can just judge by the RPM seat of the pants, like he said. He's got to keep his cool. Under tremendous pressure, some riders tend to overamp and just go too fast, so he may overshoot. He's made 39 practice jumps over the last couple of days, looking for a jump of exactly 160 feet. Here comes Kid. Oh, he is that on it. That was fantastic. He was within five feet of that marker. That is going to be hard to beat. Chas Saunders, his crew chief, threw both arms in the air. He likes it. And now there is Spanky Spangler on the extreme left. As they look for his touchdown point, now they find it. You see the chip there at the bottom center of your screen, inside that circle. That is where a $100 Casino Magic chip has been nailed into that triple-thick plywood ramp. It appears as if he'll be just under 160 feet, probably somewhere in the vicinity, Johnny, of 166, 167 feet. I believe that. I think that uh, the ramp is huge, but it's set up exactly for this kind of jumping, distance jumping. And as we said, this is simply for accuracy right here. And there's Robbie Knievel warming up, doing his first speed run, while Spanky Spangler officially marks the first jump of the evening. This is an accuracy jump. This is a target jump where really excessive distance doesn't do you any good whatsoever. They'll have a couple of opportunities to sail as long as they can go. Let's go now to Gary Davis on the pitch. Gary? I am here with Eddie who made a spectacular jump. I'm told now that you've missed the mark by seven foot, seven inches. But you feel good about that anyway, don't you? I feel good, yeah. It was a good jump and uh, this is just a warm up. Let's see what I do on the bit next one. I'm going to plan on going 250 plus. And I believe he'll do it, folks. The jump 152 feet 5 inches for Eddie Kidd. And now, Robbie Knievel. Down the 30 foot takeoff tower onto the 600 foot runway. Robbie, now committed to the jump. Again, very, very close to that chip. And again, the one closest to it will receive $1,000 in Casino Magic Chips. It looks to me like one jumper jumped to one side of the ramp, one on the other, but it's the direct line of sight measurement. Here comes Robbie down the acceleration tower, checking his gas for the last time as Petcock. You've got to make sure that gas is turned on when you're jumping ramp to ramp. Here he comes. He's up. The front end comes a little bit high, but he tacks the rear brake. You can see the front end shake, a little bit of head shake there from the bottoming. And another replay. Front end comes up, rear brake drags. That transfers the spinning mass of the rear wheel into the frame, bringing the front end back down. Here's the point of view, the helmet cam look. That's what Robbie Knievel is looking at, trying to sight in that chip. Now he sees it, slams the back wheel down. And he, too, is in that vicinity of 153, 154 feet, his back tire. It's the first tire to come down 
And Johnny, I think he is somewhere in that vicinity where Eddie Kidd landed, 150, 253 feet. I think that's great. They're very, very close. I think they're very evenly matched in ability. And now the pressure is really going to start mounting as they prepare for the distance competition. Next, they're going to spread the ramp gap. And we're going to go down to Gary in the pits. OK, we're down here with Robbie, who just made his jump. It's eight. You missed it by a foot a bit more than he did. Um, how do you feel about that, Robbie? That's all right. I'm all yeah. done gambling at Casino Magic anyway. <laughs> I'm glad Eddie won that money. He needs it. <laughs> okay, so that was a warm-up jump for you. You're still going to go plenty far tonight, aren't you? A lot of cards, big guy. Okay, we're ready to do uh, to do the cards when you guys are. All right. As you look at this crowd, capacity crowd has found their way to base St. Louis, Mississippi, for this competition tonight. One that. Really, the seed was planted some 14, 15 months ago. It was originally scheduled for March the 12th in Panama City, Florida, but a huge storm moved through the Sunshine State. And tonight is the night. Now the cut of the cards to see who will go first in the first okay, competitive Eddie, go distance it. jump. Eddie Kidd will draw first. A king of spades. The Hard lowest card beat. will jump. The two of spades. It will be Robbie Knievel. Mounting the takeoff tower first. There's his crew chief, Bill Rundle. Right now. You got 10 minutes. Right now. You heard Gary Davis informing Robbie Knievel he is on a 10 minute clock now. He must begin his run down the takeoff tower 10 minutes from right now. Johnny, did it take you the full time? Did you like to? to think about it. I mean, they've had months to think about it. The last 10 days here on site to think about it. Do you want to mount that ramp and go or will Robbie take some time to think it over? I think it's best to take your time and think about it because every jump has to count. You have to be absolutely mentally prepared for each jump. And if you fold at the last second because you hesitate or you're not sure of yourself and you don't fully commit, you're in for some big trouble. And I'm getting nervous right now because uh, Robbie could conceivably jump to the very bottom of this 158 foot landing ramp. A lot of things happen in that space of time. You can loop out. You can endo. You can do a flying W off that launch ramp. It can get pretty bad out there. And Robbie is under tremendous pressure. Both of these jumpers are strong personalities. They're going to do their very best to take the other man out. This is a for real deal. And when you're as high as an interstate overpass doing 90 miles an hour, when you hit the ground, it better be on two wheels. Their practice jumps yesterday and today farther than anyone else has ever jumped. And they did it with such routine, Johnny, that I think most of us began to think this has to be a walk in the park for both Eddie and that man right there, Robbie Knievel. But when you talk to their crewman about an hour ago, Bill Rundell for Robbie and certainly Chaz Saunders for Eddie Kidd. They both feel the nerves and they were saying a practice jump is just that it's a practice jump. But when you're going for it all nobody's going to hold anything back now. That's absolutely right. It's like sparring and boxing with 16 ounce gloves and you put the six ounces on and go for the gold. Those punches hurt a little bit more and they punch a little bit harder and put a little bit more into it and they're a little harder to knock down. Robbie's bike, a Honda, pretty much a stock CR 500 CC bike. About 220, 240 pounds, about 100 pounds lighter than the bike his father rode into the history books 15, 20 years ago. Evil rode a bike, a Harley that was up around 350 pounds. That's right. He rode Harleys, American Eagles, Triumphs, BSAs, Nortons. He's ridden all the four stroke street bike types, you know, big 750s, 650s, and all that. And uh, being a four-stroke man, that's the kind of bike that, you know, Knievel rode. A lot of the riders back then rode four-strokes. Nowadays, the primary jumpers are riding 500cc single-cylinder two-stroke water pumpers with 12 inches of travel front and rear, where back in the old days, they only had three or four inches. 150-foot ramp separation. Is it a speed run? Yes, as he pulls off. I would not be surprised to see several speed runs, two or three, because uh, under this pressure, he's got to know what he's doing. He's got to be confident, and he's got to follow through. And uh, 
the first couple speed runs just get your confidence up get your speed where you think that you can land where you want to. Interesting to look at Robbie Knievel's uh, rear tire. It's a knobby. It's not the, your street configuration. Why? Robbie believes, uh, as some jumpers believe, that the knobby is stiffer carcass, higher profile, and uh, he's always had good luck with the knobbies, and actually with these ramps, they're painted with sand paint, so there's really not a major traction problem. So uh, under different conditions, the knobby would be ludicrous, but here it's acceptable in that, you know, we've got a decent traction situation, and we've got plenty of room to gain speed. Again, the ramp separation, 150 feet. Knievel's got it lined up, and he'll pull off once more. When you do your final speed run, and you know that you could have gone on that one, and you're ready to go for the next one, your heart starts beating just as soon as you pass that launch ramp, and it is heavy, heavy pressure. Robbie Knievel well into his 10-minute time limit, approaching five minutes. He has a total of 10 to make this first competitive jump. And there he's talking things over with his crew chief. There's a good look from the helmet cam. What are they dialing in right now, Johnny? What's going through Robbie Knievel's mind? Robbie's just telling his crew chief exactly how he stands, if he's going to do one more speed run and then jump, or if he's going to do the jump right now. Suspension such a critical element in jumps this high and jumps this far. Especially since the landing ramp is so long and flat. It's a tremendously flat angle. That means a really hard landing. And this configuration is set up for distance jumping. The launch ramp is a somewhat flatter angle than some other jumps. But since we're going for distance, they figure that by going high speed, they'll cover a lot of ground in the air. And uh, with such a long landing ramp, you're certain to land on it. Earlier this week, Robbie had suspension problems. He told us he tightened it up, stiffened things up. They revalved it, added stiffer springs to both the front and back suspension. Because he was casing out or bottoming out on that landing ramp. And today, we didn't see any evidence of that whatsoever. So apparently, they have at least the suspension dialed in to perfection. Well, I believe they're going to push the limits, and I think they're definitely going to bottom. Both guys are going to bottom hard. I noticed that uh, Eddie Kidd's suspension is soft compared to Robbie's, but I can guarantee you they're both going to bottom very hard, and it'll be difficult to even hang onto the bars when they land. This kind of landing knocks the breath out of you. It can break the bike. I've broken handlebars doing this stuff before, and with that flat landing ramp and going as far as he possibly can, you, you just never know what's going to happen. He's got the race face on this time. He's got it lined up. He is committed. Evil's first jump in the neighborhood of 200 feet. And his longest practice jump, Johnny Airtime, was about 170 feet earlier today. Ooh, this stuff drives me crazy. I hope these guys get through tonight. Spanky Spangler officially marking where the rear tires set down. And it now appears as if it's back at about 185 to 190 feet. Here's the replay. Robbie comes up. He keeps the front end down real nice this time, flying somewhat level. Gets slightly crossed up, making corrections, and then he sets down. Another look, the POV. Here's what Robbie's looking at. The only view you definitely don't want to have. Wham! That thing just rebounds so hard. You can see the front end come off the ground right there. Another look. Watch the front end rebound and bounce right off the ramp. That tells you it's completely bottoming, and when they start really airing it out, you're going to see this get a lot worse. 192 feet is the official mem measurement for Robbie Knievel. And now it is up to Eddie Kidd to chase a figure of 192 feet. Johnny, Eddie leaned out of his motorhome less than an hour ago after a two-hour nap, smiled and said, I'm looking at a minimum of 250 on my first competitive jump. Can we believe it? 
I don't believe at this time because I don't think he has to do that. He's just going to get something of a lead. He might jump 20 or 30 feet farther if he's aggressive. And uh, if he goes any farther than that, I think he's uh, overamping on the jump. He needs to play it somewhat conservative, maybe go 220 or so. But to just blow out with a 250 would be risking the entire contest at this point. Eddie Kidd now well into his 10 minute clock. He's got 10 minutes to make his first competitive jump again. The separation of the launch ramp and the landing ramp 150 feet. Both these riders wear outfits with no pads. They're wearing full leathers. Eddie actually uses blue jeans with chaps. And most jumpers do use the pads. Different types of plastic with uh, pads underneath. And I would certainly not want to go down at these speeds without pads myself. This is a rather unique outfit that uh, Eddie Kidd wears, designed by Vivian Westwood Designs out of London, England. She has designer shops all over the world, and he's quite proud of, uh, of Vivian's designs. He's a good looking man and he dresses to the T. You gotta say that about Eddie Kidd. Well, at age 16, Eddie Kidd jumped 13 double decker buses, but on his landing, he slid into his dad, broke his dad's collarbone, also ran his bike into a couple of friends, breaking their legs. Ed Eddie breaking their legs. Eddie had a concussion. He didn't remember anything about it. Or sometimes he, he evidently landed on his back and uh, went out and slid down the embankment on the other side of a ravine. Another speed run for Eddie Kidd. Now, Eddie made about five to ten more practice jumps than did Robbie Knievel this week. They both had a maximum of 40. I think Eddie took his 40th jump about 4.30 this afternoon. That's right, and I was watching both of these jumpers in practice. Uh, Eddie Kidd is keeping the front end down a little better than Robbie, but, you know, when they start really gassing it, the shape of the ramp interacting with the suspension of the motorcycle combined with rider technique could bring the front end down for Robbie. These things, these dynamics occur when they get really intense. Eddie Kidd, the Black Knight from London, England. His crew chief, Chaz Saunders, is walking up the landing ramp. And Eddie is trying to dial him in. He's showing him right there is where Robbie Knievel landed. Now Chaz will back up. Eddie continues to dial it in. He's stopping at about 220 feet. 150 from ramp to ramp. And he stood at the 70-foot mark of the landing ramp. So 150 and 70 would be 220. Now Chaz is running down the runway to talk things over with his jumper. You know, earlier this week, Johnny, Eddie was having a casing problem. He was bottoming out, so they went to a larger front wheel. Well, I'm not so sure that that'll solve the problem because of the same uh, diameter and radius is in effect. So uh, it may help somewhat, but that might be more dependent on tire pressure and suspension settings. But the farther they land down the ramp, the steeper the angle they come in at and the higher their drop comes from. So they're dropping farther, landing at a more steep angle to the three-degree landing ramp. That's one of the flattest landing ramps I've ever seen. I believe Eddie Kidd is ready to go. He has a total of 10 minutes to make his first distance jump. Robbie Knievel, on his first jump, sailed 192 feet. Kid wants to fly by that with plenty to spare. Let's listen now to Eddie Kidd as he gets set to go.
Boy, he landed sitting down with some limp legs. Looks like he's got about a 50-foot lead on Robbie Knievel right now, maybe 30 feet. But he landed sitting down, and he got some major spinal compression on that one. That could hurt him. He's had a, a back injury recently, which he's trying to get ready for and get prepared and training for. He's been riding a bicycle 56 miles a day. And let's go for a replay. Here Eddie Kidd hits the ramp with total intensity in the attack position. Front end is down, he's flying level, but he gasses it in the air, bringing the front end up. Boom. Hard landing. In the neighborhood, Johnny, of 210 feet. Look at the way Kidd brought those handlebars up at the point of takeoff. Oh, that was a good spinal compression. I hope that he's okay after that. He certainly won't anyone let anyone know. We're going to go with a POV here. Here we go. The front end is down. Now it's coming up. Wham! Officially, the distance 214 feet. A 22-foot advantage now yes. for Eddie Kidd. Yes. And that has certainly put the pressure now on Robbie Knievel. Now they're going, they're going to stretch the ramp gap to 175, and, and they're going to go again. Let's go down to Gary in the pits. I'm here with one happy Eddie Kidd. How do you feel, pal? Well, can I say I'm over the moon, man? I'm ready for the next one. Did you hurt your back on that yeah, one? I hurt, yeah, the suspension kicked a little bit, and the front end, I don't like to jump the front end. And it went off to the left or the right. I can't remember now. I was having such a good time up there. But um, it didn't go to plan. On the next one, hopefully, we're going to go a little bit further. Now, you were real level in the air the whole time. It wasn't until you got a, across your uh, a down ramp that you then, finally raised yeah, the front end. Yeah, I think I just pulled it up a bit too much, and uh, I hurt my back a little bit. But we'll be ready to go for the next one. You did a great job. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Eddie said he was going to pull out all the stops on his first jump for distance, and he did just that, 214 feet for Eddie Kidd. Well, we are along the banks of the Gulf Coast, right here at Casino Magic, and what a beautiful casino complex it is. Okay, we're back down with our two heroes again. Robbie, who is now 22 feet behind at this point in the game, is going to draw first. Four clubs. Two of spades. Right, man. Eddie Kidd will jump first. Fours are tough, man. The fours are tough. A capacity crowd here in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, on the Gulf Coast. After one jump, it is Robbie Knievel out at 192 feet, and Eddie Kidd, just as he said he would do, he was going to pull it all out and go for the gold on his first jump. And Johnny, he did just that. He leads now by 22 feet as they approach a ramp gap of 175 feet. A 22-foot margin. The jump clock at 8.44 in How many? the counting. Five minutes gone? Nine. Oh. Nine. Okay. Well. All right. Good go. Okay, I'll, I'll goggle. Okay. Yesterday, we watched Eddie jump. Johnny, and he was jumping off to the right. He was landing about a foot, two feet right of center because of a very gimpy left leg. Yes, he hurt himself recently, and that left leg, he was favoring it. So that caused the suspension to do a pogo stick effect, sort of like Gary Wells did at Caesars Palace. And he moved off to the right, but this landing ramp is 16 feet wide, so it's plenty wide to catch him. Now I'd like you to see Eddie pulling on the helmet. Got his fox boots on, his Oakley goggles, and he gets set to go. Yes, both these riders wearing boots, but Robbie Knievel wears boots that are like street riding boots. Eddie Kidd is riding with Fox motocross boots. They're a lot more supportive with plastic inside the leather. Very strong boots, hard to get injured through those. Now you talk about the injury factor and the, the chance of injury and certainly the the chance for death in a competition of this. This is unquestionably one of the greatest thrill sports of all time. And Johnny, 
We've talked about it a couple of times. You've been airborne over 4,000 times. Likewise, these two riders tonight. And I think sometimes people forget these are human beings. These are people aboard these very powerful pieces of machinery. That's right. Eddie Kidd's got to have a lot of confidence. Let's talk about the confidence factor here. He's in the lead right now. He's got to come back and maintain that lead. He's got to second guess what is Robbie going to do when he comes out. Now, if Eddie comes out with a tremendous jump this time, which it could very well be, Robbie has the most pressure he's ever had in his life. We can expect a speed run here. I've got a physics question for the viewers at home. Does it take longer to throw a ball up into the air or for it to come back down from the apogee that is the highest point the ball comes and catch it back in your hand what takes longer going up or coming back down or does it take the same amount of time discuss it among yourselves and I'll tell you after this jump what the answer is does the same pertain to a motorcycle rider as he takes off reaches apogee and comes down that's absolutely correct as long as you measure from the point where the launch ramp at the top of the launch ramp horizontal line how long does it take to get from that point to the apogee? And then how long does it take to get back down to that 10-foot point in this case? What takes longer? Eddie Kidd is a talker atop that takeoff tower. He's got it lined up, and again, he pulls it out. Another speed run, his second here before he attempts the separation of 175 feet. Robbie Knievel behind by 22 feet. Talked to Robbie earlier today in his motorhome, Johnny. I said, why now? Why now do you put the Knievel name on the line against another competitor? It's never been done before. He said, Phil, my dad and I have been challenged all of our lives. I finally felt there was a worthy challenger. Eddie Kidd was the guy I wanted to go up against. And Eddie Kidd is a worthy challenger here. Like I say, I think these guys are very evenly matched. Eddie Kidd may have the edge in physical conditioning, and he's a little bit lighter in weight. And when you go to the mega distances, I believe a lighter rider lands softer. Just like the difference between jumping a 250 and a 500. The 500s on a motocross track just land heavier. Feels like you're jumping on a refrigerator or something, and a 250 is just a much lighter landing. Now, when you're jumping ramp to ramp, it's nice to have that 500cc horsepower because when you're doing high speed, you can change speed quickly on a 500. 250 just takes longer. And when you're doing 100 to 150 feet a second off the launch ramp, you need all the power you can get. Unlike Robbie Knievel, Eddie Kidd uses a street rear tire. His primary bike, as we mentioned, a CR500 Honda provided by Bay Honda in Panama City, Florida. That's right. He uses these Metzlers, which have an excellent uh, rubber compound and tread pattern. And uh, although it's a somewhat low profile rear tire, which may be the problem with his frame bottoming on the ramp, I believe his suspension is basically a little soft for this task, but it's really hard to find springs that are tough enough to handle this stuff. Nobody makes it. Let's listen again to Eddie Kidd. short of his first jump. That's an increased ramp gap. It's 175 feet, so they're going to add the distance down the landing ramp. They're measuring from the beginning of the protective apron. The protective apron is 50 feet long, and that doesn't count. That's just there to protect them in case of a disastrous. Watch this landing. You'll see the tremendous head shake after he lands. The swing arm flexes. He bottoms, and look at that bike go sideways. Boy, when they start really stretching on the next jump. Eddie off the bike now as his crew backs it up. 
Eddie talking things over with his handlers as the measurement continues out around 190, 95 feet. Watch him get a little sideways here. His front end is coming up dangerously high. This can lead to disaster scenarios like the loop out. They could get bucked over the bars in a flying W. And uh, that was a 202 foot jump officially. Now there is what Eddie saw as he approached that landing ramp. The front wheel beginning to loop out. How he held on, I'll never know. Boy, that can rip the bars right out of your hands, and that could injure your hand. And he's using steel handlebars, not uh, not the aluminum bars. He's using a handlebar that has been beefed up. He's got a couple of welded brackets onto it to, to keep those handlebars from torquing. That's right. He's got two crossbars welded in. His mechanic made them himself, modifying existing bars. Now, Eddie Kidd, apparently there is some discussion uh, about something we are uncertain of at this point. Eddie is walking over talking to uh, one of the officials, Michael Fry. Well, Gary Davis, you're in the pits. What's happening right now? Well, I'm, I'm told that um, there's a discrepancy over the fact that Robbie has added a little piece of uh, of uh, wood at the bottom of his ramp as a transition before he gets up onto the approach ramp. Eddie has chosen not to use that. There it seems to be a discretion, a, a little bit of a, uh, a disagreement about whether or not either one of them can use it. Eddie's coming over to us now. Eddie? Now there's that extension you spoke of. It's about a 20-foot <laughs> extension right there. Robbie wanted it. Johnny, why did Robbie want that? Well, this basic ramp shape is a wedge ramp. When you add the pilot ramp at the base, it breaks the 12 degree angle down between a six and then a 12 or roughly that kind of angle. It makes it a softer impact when you hit the base because you can knock your breath out hitting the, a wedge ramp at the base at high speed. So this just takes the curse off the ramp at the base. Now let's go to Gary once more. Gary? Okay, I've got Eddie with me this time. And uh, first of all, Eddie, that was an incredible jump again. You pulled that one off. That was a that you were up there. I just don't understand what's going wrong. We've been training, we've been going fine. The bike has been flying beautifully through the air. And I don't know if it's because I'm going close now. It's making that baby just fly right up. Sure it is. You're you're whining the throttle a lot more than you did in practice. Now I noticed there's a, a little argument going on out there. Yeah. That's what that's all about. Well, Robbie's uh, added a piece of the ramp to make it a lot smoother. In the contract, it says the ramp is set at a certain height and certain length. You can't start adding parts to the ramp. It's like going to get a fresh pair of balls for when you're playing tennis. You can't do that, man. Um, okay, so they're they're deciding about what that's all about, whether they're going to allow him to use it again or not. Exactly. Yeah, he shouldn't be allowed to use it. Okay. Um, in any event, you uh, you pulled a great jump off again. That was you know 202 what? feet. 202, right? That worked. Okay. So that's a little bit shorter than your last jump. A total. Accumulated distance now of 416 feet for Eddie Kidd. I think Robbie Knievel is going to air it out on this one, and I'll elaborate on that last jump. When you're going that fast, the wind is hitting your chest so hard, your chest is acting like a parachute, and when it acts like a parachute, it tries to go to the back, and the bike tries to leave. You turn into basically a dart. No matter how you throw a dart, the heavy end leaves, and the fins go to the back. When you've got all that pressure on your chest, it causes the loop out. And another factor, the fear factor. When you're pushing it to the ragged limit, and if, if you've seen any jumps of any kind, whether on motocross tracks or otherwise, when you reach your personal limit, you tend to freak out and loop out. The front end comes up, and in extreme cases, you can land right on your back. Robbie Knievel needs a jump of 225 feet to take a lead. His first jump, 192 feet. Eddie Kidd's cumulative total after two jumps, 416 feet. To answer the question about what takes the most time for the ball to go up or to come down, for the jumper to go up or come down to the same level they took off from, it takes the same amount of time. the ramp separation at 175 feet. Again, he pulls off to the left his second speed run. 
What a tremendous event. We talked at the outset, Johnny Airtime, that for years, dating all the way back to the 60s, when Evil Knievel began making huge headlines, motorcycle jumping has been a spectacle. It's been a one-jump event where these riders have had months, weeks, days to think about targeting that one jump. This right puts here. all that aside. That's right. Right here, this is the birth of motorcycle jumping as a sport, and I'm sure it's going to have to go through its uh, pains of trying to walk and then run. We might have to change up certain parts of the format. Maybe ramp shapes will gradually evolve, but I think that it's a step in the right direction, and uh, <clears throat> I've thought that this would be a fantastic idea for a long time. There just aren't very many people in the world willing to participate. An evil waits. You see the clock ticking away. He has five minutes and 30 seconds now to commit to his second competitive jump. The ramp space, 175 feet. If you just joined us, Eddie Kidd has just jumped this space at 202 feet. Robbie needs 225 feet on this jump to take a lead. You see him checking the fuel pet cock and checking the choke. Every once in a while, he'll be pulling a choke up and down to just keep the thing running clean. He might be running a little bit lean or something, and uh, every engine runs a little bit differently. It's got its quirks. Well, earlier this week, he had problems with the, the pilot, the main, and the needle jets, and it was really a problem they just got worked out late yesterday. They, in this humidity, Bill Rundle said we couldn't quite figure it out. Is he committed to going here? Robbie Airborne, and this is a big one. Oh, it's a huge jump. That was fabulous. He kept the front end down. You could see him dragging the rear brake in midair. You could see the front end come down, notching twice. And that was unexpected. He, he maintained fantastic control of the motorcycle. Going into this next jump, it's going to be heavy drama. That could well be the biggest jump of the night. Watch Robbie Knievel lift the fork, and there he goes. If you watch closely, you see the front end notching down twice. This angle, you can't see it so well. But then he plants the rear tire. Perfect Total trajectory. There he goes. This is basically what you want in the air. Level flight, you want your actuals axles actually to travel in the trajectory another look the POV shot here's what Robbie saw and this is the attitude you want to maintain in the air Johnny is Knievel accelerating all the way through that launch ramp or does he back off just before the moment of takeoff I think he backs off rolls it off at the that top of the launch ramp the nicest jump of the evening, but you work the bike the whole time in the air. We tell you tap the brake and bring the front end down a couple times. You're only two feet behind. You brought it all the way back to that. I'm the best in the world. I'm going to nail his ass this time, first or second. I'm behind two feet. Two feet. He's done. 223. Good job, man. Good job. Here's where we win. He is one foot behind. Two feet behind. The longest right. jump of the night, 223 feet. Here's where it gets heavy. You can believe he'll challenge him. Knievel, under the rules, will have to go 203 feet to take a lead. He has to go longer than Eddie Kidd's jump of 202 feet on the 175 no, foot separation. There's, there's no card cut if it's if we go. There's no card cut. It's a it's a challenge. There is no okay. card cut. It is a it's challenge. It's down to the challenge at this point. It's up to you whether you challenge to go on or not. At this point, he's got you by a foot. I, I definitely challenge any kid in my home of America. Are you kidding? That means you're the next person to jump to make the mark, and we'll see if he has to beat it or not. All right. Well, uh, how much time do I get? <laughs> he gets 10 Who minutes. Get there is the something. situation. You Who now, would ever this, believe it? Eddie Kidd, after two jumps, 416 feet. Robbie Knievel, 415 feet. And Robbie Knievel has just issued the challenge. He is going to go. 
He will need a jump of 203 feet minimum. Beautiful. A 202 feet that Eddie Kidd jumped on the 175 foot space separation, plus the one foot he's behind. If your VCR is not on now, you better get it on because this next jump is going to be the biggest jump either one of them has ever attempted. There is no telling what's going to happen here. They are totally close. They could go to the far end of the landing ramp and we could see conceivably a 250, 260 foot jump if they totally air it out. Now the question that I'm sure Eddie Kidd once answered is are they going to take away that initial little ramp that Robbie Knievel wants so desperately? Johnny, if you were jumping against Knievel, would you demand that being taken away? I would personally uh, run a different shape of launch ramp. Uh, I don't use the wedge or the bi-angle ramp. I have a totally different shape, and I would probably demand having my own shape. Now there's the situation. Just over two feet, and Robbie Knievel takes the lead. And then he would force Eddie Kidd to try and catch him. The official distance, 200 and four feet. That is Knievel's mark here. Minimum 204. I'll tell you what, when you're jumping off in competition, if I was participating in something like this, I would have to get paid a lot of money. I hope these guys are getting paid a lot of money. Anybody doing this, they're risking the rest of their career on a jump off competition. One time shot to do it all. Take the cash and run. And you better run away instead of being carried away on a stretcher. Robbie Knievel's first jump, 192 feet. His second outing, the biggest of the night, the biggest in his life, 223 feet. Back in 1989, when Robbie cleared the fountains of Caesar's Palace, that jump was only 150 feet over the fountains. That tells you how huge this jump was a moment ago. Really, they're 70 feet farther than that right now, and they could conceivably go 100 or more farther than Caesar's Fountain. Robbie with the speed run here. His takeoff speed with this ramp separation of 175 feet, Johnny airtime nearing 100 miles an hour. That's right. And I've got another physics question. In a vacuum, not considering the ambient air temperature, density, altitude, humidity, and all that, does a rider slow down in the air, or does he speed up? Or does he stay the same throughout his trajectory in midair? If you pay attention in math and physics class, you'll know the answer. After this jump, I'll give you the answer to that physics question. Al Robbie Knievel, the spirit of America is riding on that Honda CR500 right there. He told me earlier today that to beat that man, Eddie Kidd, the Black Knight from England, he would call upon everything he has. And one of the things he treasures most, he said, is his belief in his spirit. He said earlier to me today, tell my dad who's watching in Portland, Oregon, that I'm carrying the name Knievel on my shoulders and dad, I'm gonna carry it proudly. Knievel, he's got it lined up. He's committed to going. And another huge jump. In the vicinity of 210 to 225 feet, I believe, Johnny. I expected more. I expected Knievel to absolutely air it out to 250. But without a speedometer, he doesn't know how fast he's going. It's seat of the pants, and he has to just go for what he knows. Now with Eddie Kidd having the chance to come back, we will see what he's got. He needed 204 feet to force Eddie Kidd to come back and beat him. I don't know if he got 204. It, they're measuring it awfully close. There he goes. He keeps the front end down fairly well, but it's coming up, up, up. And he lands safely. That kind of uh, landing can pull your arms right out of the sockets. It's very hard landing. He needs 204 to force Eddie Kidd to mount the takeoff tower once more. Eddie Kidd is watching with tremendous anticipation. 
210 feet. He has done it. With a cumulative total of now of 626 feet tonight on three jumps. Robbie Kidd has forced, Robbie Knievel has forced Eddie Kidd into a final jump. I think Robbie Knievel has represented America in a favorable way here. He's done his very best. Emotions are high here. I can overhear the crew talking right now. And Eddie Kidd knows he's got to muster everything he's got to beat Robbie Knievel. He seems confident. Let's take a look at that last jump. There's Robbie lofting off the launch ramp. The front end's coming up somewhat, but he's in good control still. A little bit crossed up correcting. You can see his elbows come down on landing. Front end rebounds. POV. Robbie goes off the launch ramp. You don't want to go short on this kind of jump. Boom. One more look at Robbie Knievel's final jump of the night, and this is the one that will force the Black Knight back to the takeoff tower, and there he goes. Kid landing, pardon me, Knievel landing at an exact 210 feet, and he knew he nailed it. So now it is all up for the 31-year-old daredevil from London, England. He needs 210 feet to win it all. To answer the question on do you slow down or speed up in midair, the answer is on the way up, you're slowing down. And on the way down, you're speeding back up. And when you reach the height that you started at, you're doing the same speed you took off at. And when you're landing in a lower spot, like on a landing ramp, you're actually landing a little faster than you took off. That's in the back here. Eddie Kidd making his first speed run. Johnny, if you're out there ready to mount that ramp, do you want to know exactly what you need to win the competition, or would you rather not know? I would rather know exactly. Information and education is key in the sport. A lack of information could kill you. And right here, a lack of information could lose the competition for you. And if your information is good, and it's based on good sound logic and good numbers that you can absolutely rely on with your life, Eddie Kidd's first jump, 214 feet. He came back to go 202, and now he finds himself 210 feet from the winner's circle. Again, pulls off for a second speed run. repeated it again this evening, Johnny, that he was going to go over 200 feet on all his jumps tonight, and so far he has lived up to that claim. Well, he's threatened to do a 250-foot jump, and as of right now, he has yet to, uh, to make that happen, but here is his chance, and if he plays it safe, which is playing it unsafe, if he goes to the 250 mark, that'll be good enough uh, padding to make sure that his judgment wasn't off too far. Keep in mind, he came into this competition with a gimpy left knee on, on that first jump of 214 feet, Johnny. He suffered that spinal compression that he told Gary Davis really hurt him on that landing. That's right. There's no telling how bad it's hurting him now, but he has to blow that pain off. When you're doing stunts like this, sometimes you've just got to go right through the pain and go for the gold. Unquestionably, the biggest jump of Eddie Kidd's jumping career awaits him. He knows he needs 210 feet to take out Robbie Knievel. The separation is 175 feet. Kidd is committed. He's off the launch ramp. And he held on. He held on. I can't believe he saved that one. He almost looped. He landed with the rear brake on. Oh. 
All Robbie can do now is wait, and I think he knows the answer. He is standing just to the left of us, and with a look of dejection. I think Eddie's hurt. I think he got that spinal compression we were talking about. He's off the bike and on his knees. Gary Davis is down there. Gary, what does it look like? He's down here. He's, he's, he hasn't given us an answer on what exactly hurts him yet. It's his back. He's, he's mostly knocked the air out of himself right now. He's just trying to get his wind back. Now, while the authorities look over Eddie Kidd, they are measuring the official distance. As we had said, he was going to let the air out on that one, and indeed he did. He needed 210 feet to win it. Here's the replay. Eddie Kidd in the air. You can see the yet? front end coming up tremendously. Look how those forks are almost level, parallel with the ramp. That spine just got totally compressed. His seat is only about two inches thick, so that gives him a lot of compression when he bottoms out into the frame of the motorcycle under that seat. Hard on the rear brake, Johnny. Still couldn't bring him out of that uh, looping position. Here's the POV shot. Best shot in the house. You'll look right into the night here as that front handlebar comes up. Eddie somehow held on. Mm. He's up. Eddie's up. He's all right. Oh, and just ah, look at he and Chas Saunders. He can't believe it. He was a yeah. oh, yes. 215 yes. feet yes. for Eddie Kidd. Take the photo of this. 215 feet. He needed 210. It is the Black Knight by a mere five feet. That's absolutely right. I could not believe this competition was so close. I would never have predicted that. Kids coming out. Robbie Knievel gave it everything he had. Neither the name Knievel nor Eddie Kidd should hang their head in this competition. It was a tremendous Woo! event. Woo! Right, Officially, Eddie Kidd wins it by six feet. And look at those totals. Good job, mate. Hard to believe. Way to go, Robbie. Robbie. Good job, man. Good job, Robbie. All right. Gary Davis, you're standing right alongside Eddie Kidd. How's he feeling, Gary? Okay, we're with the new world champion, Eddie Kidd, right here. Eddie, tell us about the injury you got to. Uh, I thought I was coming off, man. But I wasn't going to let, I told my father I was going to take that belt back to England. That's what I've done. Yes! This is for you, Dad. A very happy man. He really saved it that time. Oh, I mean, man, I just don't know what's going on with Everybody in the pit was sure you'd looped it. I thought it was looping, man. I just hang on there and uh, somebody up there looked after me. Good job. Congratulations. I'm in a bit of pain. I'm going to suffer tomorrow. <laughs> and you know, Gary, I'd be curious to know whether Eddie Kidd is looking at perhaps rematching this thing in a place like Wembley Stadium in London, England. That would be a huge event to someday think that these two might meet again. I think they deserve a rematch. And I think it's nice that he thanked his father. You know, I've got my father to thank. He was nice enough to buy me my first four motorcycles, and I love him for that. It's changed my entire life. Well, certainly a very disappointed Robbie Ke Robbie Knievel, but he has to love what he accomplished tonight. A jump of 192 feet, Johnny, two jumps over 200 feet, by far the farthest either of these jumpers have ever flown before. I think it was good for them. They had to break through that, break that 200-foot barrier, and they did it with, uh, with good style, and they can be proud of themselves. Let's go down now once more to Gary Davis, now standing by with Robbie Knievel. Gary. Okay, we've got Robbie who did set the longest single jump. He's got the world distance record at 223 feet. Robbie, how do you feel about tonight's deal? Eddie Kidd deserved that, man. I represent all of America. I know you're watching. I did my best. I hold the longest distance record. Hopefully I'll get invited to his country and they'll treat me like we treated him here. 
we are the world, man, me and Eddie Kidd. I want to say hi to my little girl, Kristen, who's watching, and hi to Brittany, Brittany and Rickster. Sorry I didn't win, but I got the long distance record, man. Hi, Mom, great grandma. I won't be home with the belt until I get back from Scotland. And Dad, I'll be in good grace with the Scots. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Robbie. Well, hardly sounds like a disappointed loser, does he, Johnny? No, he did a good job, and he can certainly be proud. His entire family, Evil Knievel, everyone in his family, and in Butte, Montana, can certainly be proud of his performance, and he will be back. Well, it was a competition the likes of which has never been seen before anywhere in the United States, anywhere around the world. As we said early on in our telecast, motorcycle jumping, for the most part, Johnny Airtime has always been a one-jump spectacle. Tonight, we got to see two of the finest the world has to offer. And, and the he, winning jump belongs to the Black Knight from London, England. Here he goes. Eddie Kidd airs it out, almost loops out 215 feet later. He gets the breath knocked out of him, hurts his back, and let's hope he heals up quickly from that. This is a rough sport. There's a heavy price to pay, and careers are limited. A huge crowd on hand here tonight in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Casino Magic. They hosted an event that the practices began three, four, five, six days ago, and they have everything to be proud of as they pulled off a spectacular sporting event here tonight along the Gulf Coast. Eddie Kidd, 31 year old from London, England, at least for the time being, upends the name Knievel in motorcycle jumping. I think this will do a lot for both of their careers, and I hope that they have the best of luck, both of them. Eddie Kidd certainly deserved his shot. He's been after it since he was 16 years old. And he fulfilled his promise that he made today to be the champion. Well, Johnny, we talked about it throughout the week. Motorcycle jumping has, for a long time, had a black eye, as much as Evil Knievel did for the sport, and nobody can deny Evil Knievel was, and to a certain extent, still is a lot to this sport of motorcycle jumping. But for as much as he did, there is still a part of America, corporate America, that tends to shy away from this sport. Perhaps tonight, what Eddie Kidd and Robbie Knievel did will give this sport of motorcycle jumping the notoriety and the authenticity that perhaps it now deserves in the 90s. That's right. Now that we've got official sanctioning by the World Professional Motorcycle Jumping Association, there's Eddie Kidd walking injured. Now that we've got that, I think that we can possibly look forward to factory sponsorship, other sponsorship by hop-up shops that are involved in motocross and other sports, and the big sponsors, soft drinks, etc. It opens the door, and I think that this is the biggest motorcycle event that you can think of because it's on pay-per-view television. And I've got to thank each and every one of you for tuning in because you're creating the sport. It's the viewers that are creating the sport. It's the fans, and you can see that they've loved every minute of it. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here on the landing ramp, we have our winner tonight. But believe me, there was no loser here tonight. This was one of the most exciting things in the history of motorcycle jumping. A matter of a few feet, and hopefully we'll see once again these same two accept the challenge of the daredevil duel. How about a round of applause, first of all, for Robbie Knievel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Robbie Knievel. And here with me on the platform to present this championship belt, ladies and gentlemen, is of course our Miss Daredevil duel, Sherry Lassay Cher. And along with her, of course, the president of the World Professional Motorcycle Jumping Association, Mr. Michael Fry. Oh let me turn the microphone over to Michael Fry at this time. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the new world champion, Mr. Eddie Kidd. <laughs> History was made here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, at Casino Magic in Bay, St. Louis, Mississippi. Once again, a round of applause for these two great daredevils. Our winner, Eddie Kidd, the Black Knight of London, England. Thanks. All right, man. Thanks. 
And also being presented at this time, a check for 1,000 Casino Magic Chips, $1,000 in Casino Magic Chips. That was for the target jump, the first jump of the evening. He won both events here tonight. Once again, Eddie Kidd, ladies and gentlemen. A very happy Eddie Kidd. His three competitive jumps, 214 feet, 202 feet, and his final challenge jump that won it all, 215 feet. As I said at the outset of our telecast, welcome to the edge. And Johnny Airtime, it does not get any more thrilling than what we saw tonight. I thank God that we did not see a catastrophe tonight because I was getting very nervous. You just don't know what to expect. And, and this was no game here. These guys were playing for keeps. And uh, I look forward to talking with both these gentlemen later and seeing just how they're doing.